Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two. Are you excited? Yeah. All right. I'm a little bit more excited than you. Let's hear that one more time. Are you excited? Yeah. All right. There we go. We had so much awesome content yesterday, and I'm really excited about all of the really awesome content that we're going to see again today. Part of my uh, loves, part of the things that I'm really passionate about and why I come to a lot of these conferences is to talk to developers, hear their stories, hear what they're having fun with, hear what their challenges are, hear what their successes are, because these are a huge part of how we make Angular successful and how we make it better for everyone that's using it. I really like to think that today, it is a really great time to be an Angular developer. If you look at the state of Angular and the satisfaction levels that we've got from all of the developers that are using it, we've really achieved a really nice time. We've achieved a high level of stability, making updates very, very easy as you're moving between versions. We've got a really successful, passionate ecosystem that are building and looking at how we can do things more and better all of the time. And that's something that I really want to lean into. As I think about the things that we want to do on the Angular team in terms of encouraging community and collaborating with the developers that are out there, there's kind of three things that I think about. The first thing I think about is really bridges to Angular. There are a lot of developers out there coming from a lot of different contexts. We have a lot of developers still using AngularJS. We have developers coming from other technologies, such as C Sharp, such as Java. And we want to figure out ways to help those developers and welcome them into our community. And a big part of welcoming people into our community is this idea that I call welcome signs, which is I want to acknowledge that you've kind of arrived at Angular and really have us focus on how do we welcome those people in, how do we make it easy to get started with all of the different tools that we've got, and give them a guide and a roadmap to how they can become better developers using Angular. And then the third piece that I think a lot of the people in this room are really excited about is how can we use Angular as a bridge to take us to new technologies that really make us better developers and help us build better applications for our users and for our organizations. More maintainable code, cooler features, taking advantage of the platform as it continues to evolve. And so today's goal is I'm really hoping to convince you to take your Angular applications to the next level. What we've seen when talking to developers is we used to really focus on beginner content. How do I get started? But when we come to conferences like this, most of you are already using Angular in a professional context. And so you're less interested about basics about Angular, what a component is, what a service is, and really want to take it to the next level. And so you've heard a lot from our team this uh, past day about all of the cool new things that are possible in diving deeper into what the framework and platform provide in terms of topics like dependency injection, in terms of internationalization. And so this talk is really focused on three areas where I want to help you take the next step in your Angular applications and build even better experiences for your users and better applications for yourselves. I'm going to talk about this in three stories. First, I'm going to talk about progressive web applications, or PWAs, which are a really new, exciting way of building applications that are going to allow you to leverage the new APIs that are available as part of the browsers to radically improve the engagement of your users. Then I'm going to talk about new technologies, such as server-side rendering, that can extend and enhance the way that you deliver applications. And then last, I want to talk about building libraries. There's a lot of companies that are standardizing on Angular and choosing, hey, we need to build a library internally. And I want to talk about what that can look like and some of the challenges and opportunities for you there. So let's get started with this idea of PWAs, progressive web applications. So there was a fantastic talk from Maxime yesterday, which you should definitely go check out. But just to remind you a little bit, PWAs are a set of new APIs that allow you to take more advantage of the web as a platform and deliver better experiences. So you have things like the application manifest that collects your application. Instead of having it as a series of URLs or pages, we have a concept of an application with a starting point, with an icon, with a name, and even a color that shows up in the browser. Then we also have things like the service worker that allow us to build new experiences by caching and proxying content that's coming from the web and make sure that my application works even in unreliable internet connections or even in offline use cases. The world is mobile. When we look at building a new application or new website, it's really important that we use these things. And I'm, I'm reminded this every time that I travel. Because when you get on a plane, you lose internet connectivity. 
And to the extent that that stops you from being productive, that's frustrating to your users. And so it's really important that we as application developers think about the types of use cases for our users, because people are engaging with us in more places and in more ways than ever before. And acknowledging that new context is very, very important. We've looked at a lot of different applications. And for some classes of applications, we see about 70% of web traffic, so that's just over HTTP to a website, is about 70% coming from mobile. And in places like China, this is even higher. We see numbers like 90%. And so acknowledging mobile as an afterthought isn't really possible anymore. We really need to think about how is our mobile experience coming through with, via our web application day one. I often recommend to developers, you should, when you're in the developer tools, click on that little device emulation mode and just leave it on, because that's how most of your users are going to experience your application. It's really important to think about the needs of our users when we're building these sorts of applications. We talk about the features that we want to deliver, so whether it's offline capabilities with Service Worker, or whether it's just the having the capabilities uh, that they need at the right time, using new APIs such as the Payment Request API. It's also about performance. How do we achieve both good runtime performance, so that every interaction that they have is smooth and fast, but also startup time performance? How do we make sure that we can deliver these applications even on slower networks? I also like to think from, about our users from a couple of different perspectives, because sometimes we're engaging with users on a more transactional basis, where I have a user that's going to make a single purchase at a single time. They don't necessarily want to have a relationship with me. But then also, what are the ways that we can have deeper relationships with our users, with our customers, in terms of a longer running engagement, where they want to keep coming back, where we, they want to give us space in their lives and in their home screens? But it's also really important to acknowledge that we have organizational needs when we're building these sorts of applications. What is the development cost to be extending our applications to new experiences and thinking about new contexts? What is the complexity overhead of managing multiple platforms and thinking about all of these different users? And then how much code can we share? There's a lot of ways of delivering applications. And one of the, the metrics that's really important at an organizational level is how much of the code that I write can I reuse and can I maintain a single code base for as much of the functionality as possible. Angular is really great at letting you use some awesome solutions that exist across the web. First up, I like to talk about NativeScript. NativeScript is a way of using Angular and using the web and declarative style templates that Angular has and then expressing those things and rendering those things out as native UI widgets. We also have technologies such as Ionic, which are using a web view approach where we are shipping applications to the user via their browser embedded within an application and then giving us a JavaScript API to all of the native capabilities. This is also possible with things like Cordova, where if you want to roll your own native application, it's using the same sorts of technologies. And Ionic actually uses Cordova under the hood. But what I like to say is that a lot of people want to build this installed native application where you actually show up in the App Store or in Google Play. But most of the time, you actually have to ship a website as well. And so what I would say is if you're building a website anyway, build it as a PWA because you're going to enhance the experience for any users that have browsers that support it. And for everyone else, you've basically just done the right amount of work to deliver these great experiences via the web, which is so key. So I want to tell a few stories today. And so the first story that I want to start with is about a company called ShopStyle. They're an e-commerce platform. So if you go to shopstyle.co.uk, you'll see this. And so basically, they are a index and a search engine that allows you to find products. So whether that's furniture, home goods, clothing, accessories, those sorts of things, you are able to visit their website, search for what you want, and then they take you to that content. ShopStyle already had an Angular application when we started talking. And they were even going further than that. They were already using server-side rendering, which is something that I'll talk about a little bit before. So they were really early adopters of Angular, leaning into a lot of the very cool capabilities that we're trying to offer to developers. They even have mobile applications on iOS and Android that they built natively. And they have a huge install base that is building this great relationship with all their customers. If you like ShopStyle and you install their native application, that means you typically want to keep coming back to their app, and you're going to keep buying from them, which is good for their business. ShopStyle's success, in their words, was uh, driven by performance and by delivering smooth user experiences. So how do they define smooth? So for them, they talk about server-side rendering of content was really important for them. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit later. 
their application had to load quickly. So as soon as the user visits a link, or whether they type in the URL, we need to be showing them the content, showing them the information they need to start making decisions about their shopping experience. The application also has to be responsive. As soon as the user can see those things, their expectation is that they can interact with those sorts of things, whether it's clicking on filters and having them respond, or clicking into a product and saying, getting more information about it. And so having these smooth experiences is really important. But then we, we ended up in a conversation with them, and they heard about PWAs. And they thought, hey, maybe we should give that a try. There's basically three ways to think about PWAs today across the web. Uh, I talk about the Angular service worker, which is the opinionated Angular version of the service worker that's baked into the core framework, where we're automatically understanding a lot about your application using the, our syntactical or semantic understanding of your apps, using things like the CLI and building service workers into your application for you. But there's also a couple other very cool tools that exist out there. The first is Workbox. This was a tool that was built by the Google team, by the Chrome team, in order to help a lot of web developers who don't have the same sort of uh, DevOps infrastructure, the same sort of build infrastructure, to start adding service workers to their application and solving a lot of very common use cases. And a, a predecessor to Workbox that we still see a lot of developers use, that you're going to hear a lot about if you're doing PWAs, is SW Precache, which handles a little bit one of the challenges of Workbox, um, but it was there first and is, is a huge install base kind of across the web. So at the time, the Angular service worker wasn't exactly ready. It wasn't, uh, we didn't have CLI support at the time, and so it was a little bit early for them. So they ended up choosing SW Precache. Uh, and it was, took about a week of calendar time, but about two days of development. They got from having nothing, having a conversation about PWAs, all the way to having a prototype that was live in their dev server. So as they were building this out, I really wanted to dig into not just what uh, was successful for this, what, how easy it was, but I also wanted to understand some of the challenges to help guide everyone here as you're starting to look into these technologies. So the first challenge that they had to overcome was the idea of analytics. How do we track and understand the impact of our PWA? And so what they did is, as part of their app manifest, they set a home URL that included a UTM source. Basically, we identified the, or they identified the campaign saying, this user came from a PWA. So as soon as the user had that application installed to their home screen, every time they clicked on that, they ended up knowing that that user came from that source, and they could measure the effectiveness of that. And we'll get into some of those outcomes that they saw via those analytics in a little bit. They also had a lot of organizational mindset shifts that they had to do. So one of the challenges that they struggled with that I think they, they continue to think about is whether or not they should have a customized or personalized launch URL. Because we have these nice server-side rendering capabilities, when I render my app manifest, I could actually send down a dynamic or a custom URL for any user that is authenticated with me. So I believe at this time they chose not to do that, but it's something really interesting to consider for the future. Another challenge that they had was user notifications. So at the bottom of the screen, there's already in their application a prompt that says, hey, you should go check out our native application. So now in addition to this, they have another prompt from the browser saying you should install our PWA. And there's two other prompts that they have to think about. One is when they want to ask for permissions to display notifications. Should they be doing that at all? Should they be doing that for authenticated users? And second, when should they actually be sending these notifications? When is the right time that says, this is going to be useful to this user, and the user is going to want this notification, and it's not going to come across as spammy and make them uninstall or disengage from shop style? They also wanted to think about caching versus dynamic content. So for them, having fresh content is very, very important. And I think it is important for a lot of us. And so thinking about when and where we should be caching and, when we, and where we should have dynamic content is really important. And so today, they're not actually taking advantage of offline. Because their content is so dynamic and so fresh from the internet, where they actually rely on third parties as well to deliver shopping experiences, uh, offline doesn't necessarily make experience. But maybe there are some opportunities for that in the future. Tooling. So I asked them about their tooling recommendations. Their first one was use Lighthouse. Lighthouse is another product from the Chrome team that's now actually built into recent versions of Chrome. What Lighthouse provides is a set of audits that tell you, how good is my application? What sorts of features am I taking advantage of? Does it meet the criteria for a PWA? And so it's a really helpful tool for understanding the accessibility of your application, the performance of your application, and how well you're meeting the criteria for a progressive web app. They also recommend to use the CLI if you can. If you can't use the CLI, because there are still a few companies that are not able to use the CLI because of their build infrastructure, they found that SW Precache was a really good option as well. 
so i want to talk a little bit about their outcomes in terms of what happened after they'd shipped this experience into production and they were seeing users starting to add the pwa to their home screens so for every user that added the pwa to their home screen they saw a 90 percent increase in time on site and for those of you not in e-commerce, time on site is one of the leading and most direct indicators of how much spend users are going to have. And so having this sort of impact from just having a PWA on their home screen is really impactful. But the other half of that is, what if these users are coming from iOS or Android and they already had the native application? What, what did that do to all of the other traffic? Well, fortunately, they actually saw 0% cannibalization of their Android and iOS market share and usage. So all of the users that wanted to install the applications from the app stores still use those applications from the app stores. And people that were using the web experience, a subset of them opted to engage and deepen the relationship by installing the home screen. And we saw that 90% time on uh, screen experience increase, which was huge. So next up for ShopStyle, I think they're looking at push notifications. So they've decided not yet to do push notifications. But the nice thing about PWAs is they're progressive. You can add one feature at a time. You can keep making it a little bit better and a little bit better. So now they're looking at how can we add notifications to our application in a nice, smooth, easy way. There's also two shop style developers in the audience. Uh, if you guys want to raise your hands, if you're in here right now, uh, but definitely look for them. There, there they are. Thank you guys so much for letting us do this little story about you guys. Uh, if you have any questions about their application, feel free to ask them. If you're looking at getting started with PWAs, I highly recommend that you use the Angular Service Worker. Uh, we feel like it's the easiest way to get started because we're trying to abstract a lot of the complexity of service workers for you. So obviously, you can go deep, and you can build your own service worker from scratch if you want. And there's a lot of use cases where you may want to do that. But we find that an easy entry point for getting up to speed on these sorts of new technologies is to use the tooling that we're providing. And so we shipped a brand new service worker uh, in version 5. And we also now, uh, as of the 1.6 beta of our CLI, have support for it uh, via the build. So you add the service worker module to your application, you add the uh, service worker flag to your CLI, and every build will automatically include the service worker for you. Um, go watch Maxime's talks. He did a really great deep dive on the Angular service worker, both the version that was existed before version 5 and the new one. Uh, so huge props to him, and thank you for doing that. So another really important technology that I, I want everyone to kind of think about leaning in on is server-side rendering. When I think about server-side, so we also call this project Angular Universal. So Angular Universal is a project that allows you to, via platform server, take your Angular application, run it on the server, get out a string, and then ship that string to your users in whatever format you want. And so server-side rendering is really great for extending the reach of your application. Because while we often think about users and the people of our application, I talk about there being users of our applications that are not humans, the machines that are reading our applications, whether that's uh, a search crawler that doesn't have the capability to run JavaScript, whether that's a social network that wants to crawl and scan your content to understand it and generate things like a thumbnail. Server-side rendering can both help these machines understand your content, but they can also increase the perceived speed of your application. By rendering something faster to the screen, the user sees the application faster, and they can start making decisions. They can start engaging with you quicker. So once upon a time, there was a business publication called Forbes. And I want to invite Jason Jean onto the stage to tell us more about what Forbes is doing with server-side rendering. Thank you, Stephen. So my name is Jason Jean. I'm the lead developer on the article page for Forbes. And I'm here to tell you about how we use Angular, or what I like to say, the way of the Forbes. So this is our article page. And the most important thing for this article page is the content. We want to get the content to the user as soon as possible so that they can understand what our authors are trying to tell them. So when Angular started its development, we looked at our current article page. And there was a lot of complication in how we developed it. On the back end, we used Java and Spring MVC. And on the front end, we used AngularJS. And this was kind of confusing for us, because every time we had a new feature, we either had to do it twice once on the back end and once on the front end, or we need to involve multiple developers to develop one feature. For our new Angular page, we're really excited about doing features once, using the same code base for back end and front end, only having to write the code once. Usually, when you use a, a client framework, as many people do today, it's very slow to get content onto the screen. You have to make multiple network requests in order to get a meaningful content render. On slow connections, this can be even more painful. 
So that's why server-side rendering is very important for Forbes and its article pages to get the content there as soon as possible. When the user navigates, we do a lot of the work for them on the server, so that by the time they get their first network request back, it's a fully rendered, meaningful page. They have the content and everything else. Then they make two more network requests in order to become fully interactive, and as they go through the site even more, it's a smooth experience. It's really important to use server-side rendering when there is no JavaScript. And while we like to think that JavaScript is everywhere now, there are some cases where it's not. One of these cases is a search, op search engine optimization. And these, even though Google executes your JavaScript, not all search engines do. So if you want to be visible on all search engines, use server-side rendering to tell them what your page is about. Similarly, for social media and chatting, they use crawlers to crawl your page, which don't execute JavaScript. So it's extremely imp important to use these previews to tell you, those users through a link exactly what your page is about, maybe a thumbnail, maybe a description, so that they're more enticed to visit your site. And this will drive more traffic to your content. Also, there's times when our user has bad network. And as Steven mentioned, you can do this with PWAs, but also sometimes they might not even get the JavaScript. JavaScript is many times very large, and with bad connection, they might lose connection and never get it. And they'll be staring at a blank screen, which will be really confused. And then the last thing is, with the way the web is moving, older browsers, you may start to deprecate support for them because they can't execute your JavaScript. But if you server-side render your pages, these browsers can still understand HTML, and as long as you render meaningful content to them, they can still get your content even though they're using an older browser. The great thing about Angular is that server-side rendering works just like client-side rendering. So if you're already using Angular on the front end, you know how to use it on the back end. When we get a request, we do some routing to choose which template we're rendering. And then we can also do some server-side authentication to see whether or not this user is able to see the page. So when refreshing the data, it's important that on the server side, you put it into the HTML so that the client, when they get the HTML, they have that API data, and they don't need to call it twice. And this is possible using a state transfer API that was introduced in Angular 4. So when you're rendering your content, this is extremely important to your users because it's into the HTML. This is the first request they get back, and seconds after they get that request back, they're able to see meaningful content on the page. And then lastly, for, people, for machines, it's really important that you put page metadata onto the HTML so that they know what your page is about as well. And this will drive more traffic to your content. There's some caveats for server-side rendering that you'll run into when you start going on this journey. One of them is caching. You want to balance how long you cache your pages for to keep fresh content, but to maintain fast response times. And this will also allow you to use fewer, more scalable servers. Part of this is dynamic content. Some of your pages might have dynamic content, and that's great. But if you want to keep your pages cached or longer, think about keeping this dynamic content off of the server render and rendering with client-side rendering. Also, keep in mind what's above the fold and just what is very key to your users. Server-side rendering only lasts about three seconds on a good connection. So you can leave some of the later things and load them progressively in. There's also a lot of interactive elements, which probably don't work without JavaScript. And sometimes they don't look good if you server render them. So consider just leaving space for them so that they come in later and fully interactive. And you don't trick the users into thinking that they are. Forbes came across an issue that we had to overcome. And we used to custom elements to solve this issue. So a lot of people are wondering, with the static analysis, how do you get dynamic content rendered in? So our CMS sends us a body that's just a string. And this string has interactive elements embedded into it. So we had problems when using AOT, on how to render this content, but still keep it performant, because compiling on the runtime is expensive. So we use custom elements for this. Um, for those interactive embeds, we build custom elements around them so that the web knows how to bootstrap them outside of Angular. Then we were able to reuse these elements across our other pages, pages that don't use Angular or don't use the framework at all. Performance is like a race. You want to be as fast as you can to get content to the user. 
Because Forbes uses server-side rendering, we're able to get content in under a second to the user. Also, because we code split most of our longer bootstrap times outside of the main app bundle, this is able to start one second into the page. And then because we use AOT, when the app does get to the user, it's quick to boot up. And this happens in under two seconds. Because of all this, we're able to call our ads in under three seconds. This is extremely important to our advertisers because it gives their ads more viewability. And then also, because the content's getting there earlier, users are more enticed to in interact with their content and scroll down and to read the article. So this is how we use performance to create a better user experience. Forbes is also stayed up to date with the latest Angular versions. We started developing our Angular page just as soon as Angular itself started developing. And then when they finally released, we were really quick to ship our mostly viable product out to our users to see the differences between our old experience and the new experience that was coming. When Angular 4 was in testing, we also took the opportunity to get a sneak peek. And we also found bugs, but we contributed fixes for them so that by the time that Angular 4 released, the general public did not experience these bugs. When Angular 4 was released, we then completed our feature set and shipped our product to the full audience. And we had great success doing this. Recently, when Angular 5 came out, we also followed along and we, served, we tested the server-side performance to make sure that there was no real-world implications of switching the, the server renderer to the Domino. The journey ahead for Forbes involves improving our UX even more. And we want to do this by looking into service workers and what that can do for our audience so that they can get faster render times on repeat visits. We're also looking forward to the newest web technologies and how Angular provides this for us. Um, we want to use these as tools so that our users get a better experience out of it. And then, as we have been for the last 100 years, we like to keep highlighting success stories and offering our expert opinions on these. So that's it for me. And I'd like to just thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the conference. And may the Forbes be with you. Here's Stephen Fuller. Thank you so much, Jason. That was awesome hearing about the work that you guys are doing in order to serve your customers. I also want to thank Jason in particular, because uh, he actually became an open source contributor and added a bunch of uh, work into the Angular CLI project that helped make Angular Universal even better. And so anyone can do this. It really is possible to contribute back to the open source community and become part of all this work that we're doing. So let's give Jason another round of applause. So if you're looking to get started with server-side rendering with your applications, there is the, a lot of documentation about Angular Universal that exists on the internet. But one video in particular that I would recommend you take a, a look at or if you search for is Angular Universal and Firebase Hosting. Uh, it's by Firebase developer advocate David East. And he does a fantastic job of taking you from a CLI application all the way to a server-side rendered application using Firebase Hosting and Firebase Cloud Functions, which is a really cool combination that gives you a really fast path from getting from your application to being server-side rendered with this nice client-side bootstrap on top. So next up, we're going to talk about libraries, and in particular, building libraries that are designed for sharing code. How many people here are already building libraries that are being shared across your teams? OK. How many people want to be building libraries that are shared across your teams? OK. A lot more there. So this is an area that we're continuing to, to spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, and we've got a lot of future plans to make this easier, things like uh, we're exploring and evaluating CLI support. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about what it looks like uh, today and how people can use this as it is today. And so I'm going to tell the story of a little company called VMware. Uh, they do a cloud computing virtualization platform. Everybody heard of VMware? OK, good. So VMware has a lot of developers. Wow, surprising, right? A company that makes software has a lot of developers. This is very expected. But what ends up happening when you have a lot of developers on a lot of different teams? You end up getting inconsistencies in your UI. I'm a really big fan of this XKCD comic, where he says, hey, there's 13 or 14 competing standards. We need to make a new standard to make it even better. And now we have 15 standards, right? So this happens to a lot of us. It's a very easy trap to fall into. But fortunately for uh, VMware, this story actually doesn't end that way. So VMware 
internally uses both AngularJS and Angular. And so one of their big challenges was across all of these different teams, the UX that they were building was not as consistent as they wanted it to be. And so what they did is a team within VMware started an engineering-led project to create a full stack owned solution in terms of how we can do a design and how we can implement this design as components that are shipped via Angular. And so they released the Clarity Design System. Initially, it was released internally, but later it was open sourced. And the Clarity Design System was really designed to help build consistency across the whole company within VMware. So it's made up of a few different pieces. They released sketch templates to help people uh, mock out these things and understand what the UX would be to use this standard set of components. They released a comprehensive set of UX guidelines. So what should the application look like? What is the experience we're trying to create? What are the principles at play here when you have to make different decisions about your application? They gave you an HTML and CSS framework that allowed you to uh, prototype very quickly and get moving. And then they manifested all of this as Angular components. Their feeling was that by owning the full stack, it would actually dramatically increase adoption. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about that later. And just so you have some context, uh, in case you've never actually used some of these web-based backends, so this is vRealize. This is their old interface. And then after the Clarity Design System, we've got another one here, old screenshot. And then below there, you can see a side-by-side -side comparison of how they've tried to modernize and increase the uh, quality and consistency of their application across products. And then they even did this for their charting and uh, reporting libraries. So one of the things that VMware did is, uh, as with Forbes, they started very early. But VMware started small. And so they released uh, basically just a small, tiny set of components internally. So they started working. Uh, and within two weeks, they actually did an internal product launch with those new components. So by starting with a very small set of components and not trying to be overbroad, they were able to move quickly and figure out, OK, how should we be doing these things? What are the sort of standards that we want to apply to our company and to the way that we're building out our library? And so two weeks is really fast. I was actually really surprised to hear that. Um, but then later in 2016, they actually open source Clarity with the intention of building a broader community around the work that they were doing, which can be really impactful in terms of building a higher quality product. So I asked again VMware, what sort of challenges did they face as they were doing this? So one of the challenges that they faced was they joined us very, very early in the Angular journey. I know some of us were around for that. Uh, what I always say to developers that joined us during the uh, beta period was, thank you, I'm sorry. I say thank you because we really needed the validation. We needed to prove these concepts out in the real world. We needed to see how they work and validate them at scale. And a little bit of I'm sorry because we needed to ship code that was going to work for the long term. And I feel like as of version 2 uh, that we released in September of 2016, we've been very successful in delivering a platform that works for a lot of developers and helps them build really great applications. So uh, animations in particular, they, they ran into a lot. Um, and then just some of the changes that we were doing during the beta and the RCs. Uh, another challenge that they, they've had to spend a lot of time thinking about is how do we project external content? So I want to provide a component, an Angular component that's usable in other people's applications. What do I do with their content? When do I modify it? When do I give it multiple uh, places that I want to be rendering that? When do I use inputs? When do I use services to pass data? So all of these kind of challenges were something that they thought a lot about. So they shared a few of the best practices that they've experienced from doing this in the real world in the field. So their first tip was think about performance early and often. Angular's change detection is really powerful. And it, it, by using Angular across the whole company, they have a really nice way of having a cross-collaboration across many, many different teams. Uh, but Angular has some very cool tools for change detection, et cetera. But don't abuse it. Don't be creating extra change detection cycles for every piece of UI that you're putting on the screen. Try and tie in very naturally to the user's experience and think about what you're doing. They also recommend that you leverage services. So from their experience with their component library, they found that using inputs and outputs was actually harder for them than using just services to pass data back and forth. By using services, they were able to centralize a lot of their business logic away from the components themselves so that they didn't have any challenges managing those two things and keeping them in sync. One of the things that they experienced is that, and I, I think we all see this, is the more adoption you have, in some ways, the slower you go. Because the more people are relying on you, the more people that are expecting you not to change, the more people that have requests of you. And so it, it makes new features and new ideation take longer and longer. And so they've done a few different things that combat, combat this across the company. 
So the first thing they did is by open sourcing the project, they were able to uh, encourage more contributions. So as the amount of work increased, because the framework was becoming more and more popular for them, they were able to increase the amount of people working on it, the amount of eyes thinking about those sorts of problems. And so open sourcing can be a very successful tool in your toolbox. They also set up a set of policies and tools for their standards for how they build out these components. When should a component be managing its own state? What are the allowed inputs and outputs? What are the visual standards? How broadly do we want to define these components? And by defining those very early on, it helped isolate each of the components from each other and helped them innovate more quickly as they continued to evolve. The last thing that they've spent a lot of energy on is automation. Having good source control repositories, having good developer operations, doing things like continuous integration, having automated tests, having end-to-end -end tests, unit tests, all of these things, they sound like nice-to-haves, but especially when you're building a library, which is going to be consumed by developers that are not part of your team, having things is a key to being successful. So I want to talk a little bit about the successes that VMware has had. So this is, they, they told me this. I was, again, shocked to hear this. Within VMware, virtually all products use Clarity. So they had a bunch of different teams using different uh, UI libraries, making different design decisions, but they have virtually standardized on Clarity. And they were able to do this because it was open, because they tried to make it good enough that developers had to pull, they wanted to pull it into their applications because they didn't have the central authority to say, hey, everyone, you have to go use this. So they decided, we're going to make the best product and get all of the teams to want to adopt us and want to standardize to benefit themselves. So by open sourcing, they also opened themselves up to new modes of collaboration. So instead of just getting feedback requests and issues and things like that, they actually empowered their community, both internally and externally, to contribute back and solve some of those problems that made the product even better and better. One of the things that they saw was it wasn't just employees contributing. People in the world, and I think Angular is a really fantastic example of this, want to contribute. They want to be part of really cool products and services. And so by open sourcing, you can engage and activate the community and really empower them to help themselves at the same time. Another side effect that I, I don't know if they were intentional about this, but by having an open source design system, all of the partners that work with VMware were actually able to make applications that behave just like VMware applications. And so as a side effect of doing this, they created this continuous feeling across their whole ecosystem, not just within their own company. And so that, that was really kind of interesting to hear about that. So for collaboration, by making both a design and an implementation, they made it easier to adopt these standards across the whole company. The other thing that they saw is collaboration across teams was increased. Because you already knew how to use the Clarity design system in one part of the uh, whole company, you could use it in another, and you could have cross-collaborations across multiple different projects. So if you're looking to get started with building your own component library, I want to point you to three resources until we get some of the tooling a little bit better and automate some of these things for you. So first, we have an Angular package format specification. So if you search for Angular package format on Google, uh, you'll find it. It's the top link. Uh, I'll also be posting uh, some links to this presentation along with all of the URLs that you'll need after this talk. Uh, next, tech, check out the Angular material build system. So on the Angular team, we have a team dedicated on building Angular material, which is our vision of manifesting the material design philosophy as a component library. And so as part of building out this component library, as part of our open source project, we've actually done a ton of work to build out tooling that automates and standardizes build systems to take it from the TypeScript code that we write to the JavaScript that we want to ship out to people that are going to consume our library. Uh, I would also recommend you check out Philippe's uh, guide. He calls it the Angular Quick Start uh, Library. And so this is a really good starting point uh, if you're looking to, for code samples of how you could uh, start from scratch. While I was making... Uh, some final minute updates to this presentation. This was actually an article that launched yesterday. So another example of a company that's in the open shipping component libraries and talking about their experiences. So this was a, an article from AutoTrader. So uh, the article is called Everything is a Component, Writing Domain-Specific Reusable Angular Components Across Squads. And it echoed a lot of the things that we saw from VMware in terms of the ways that it can improve collaboration and create this pull from other teams by focusing on quality and by focusing on reusability all the way to the manifestation, all the way to the implementation of a full stack solution using Angular. So to leave us, I want to kind of just summarize. 
we've looked at how we're already great Angular applications, and it's a wonderful day to be building Angular applications for our users. But it's really now time to start leaning into all the things that we're doing and building better experiences, whether that's shipping a progressive web application for the first time and creating more engagement with all of our users and getting more traction from the people that are already spending time with us to server-side rendering, to increasing the perceived performance of our applications, as well as making it more machine-readable that will help us broaden our reach across many different places. And finally, building libraries. There was a lot of people here that raised their hands and said, I want to be building libraries. And it's definitely possible today. There are lots and lots of good libraries out there. You can take a look. A lot of them are open source. Uh, a lot of them are here as sponsors and in the exhibitor hall, so definitely check those out. Uh, but then think about, hey, how can we extend what they're doing, and how can we find our own standards that we want to apply across our company? And just remember, Angular is here to help. Thank you so much. <laughs>